77 cases involving commerce. Uh, the reality is you have to understand it's a completely new paradigm starting in that year. Before that, before 1937, the issue with interstate commerce was what you would expect, interstate commerce, commerce that involved more than one state. And the Supreme Court struck down a number of parts of the New Deal. In uh, 1935 and 1936, uh, the sector of poultry case, uh, who's had admin law in here? Raise your hand if you've had administrative law. Okay, we will not dwell too much <laughs> on that. Uh, and also uh, uh, Carter v. Carter Cole in, uh, in 1936. Uh, there were three major cases in 1935 and 1936 where the Supreme Court struck down large parts of, uh, of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, his, uh, his New Deal for regulating things uh, on commercial grounds that really were not interstate commerce. Then in 1937, we have the sea change case of Joseph Laughlin Steele. It's the National Labor Relations Board, NLRB, versus Joseph and Laughlin Steele. And in that case, the court invented the substantial relationship test. And that is that the authority to regulate interstate commerce includes the power to regulate intrastate commerce, commerce within one state, so long as that activity has a substantial relationship to interstate commerce. Of course, obviously, that gets into a big question of what constitutes uh, a substantial relationship. Now, a couple of people didn't recognize with that and a couple of quick follow-up cases there that the full extent of what the Supreme Court had done. Uh, this was what was called the, the switch in time to save nine. Uh, when FDR got, got elected to his second term in 1936, uh, he was frustrated about the fact that several times over the past two years, the Supreme Court had been striking down major parts of his deal as he was seeking to really change some, some major aspects. Of, uh, of American life. And so his solution was, well, we just need different justices on the court. So he came up with a novel idea that, you know, the work at the Supreme Court's pretty hard. And as you get older, you can't work as much. That doesn't seem fair that we just have nine people having to do all this work. I think if they're over the age of 70, we should have to appoint another justice to help to, now, the Constitution says we can't remove them, they're tenured for life, but we should lessen their workload by appointing new justices. Conveniently, that would have taken the court from nine justices to 15 justices, giving him six brand new appointments. And remember, he was getting a couple appointments through the natural attrition. Uh, he went to get six brand new seats on the Supreme Court that he would then fill out a full cloth. And, um, and conveniently, if you look at the, the split, the margins, the votes by which his New Deal programs were being struck down, if he got six new justices, it'd be a piece of cake to get everything upheld. So he, of course, put this forward as a favor to the Supreme Court. Needless to say, the, the Supreme Court wasn't speaking publicly, but no one had any doubt that they were just blistering uh, on this. But fortunately, the American people pushed back against it. They understood this for what it was. This was an absolute subversion of the constitutional court. This had the sole purpose of eradicating judicial independence. If I don't like the Supreme Court, I'll just stack it with a whole bunch of new people who are pro-New Deal lawyers who I know will be on my side. Uh, and would give, and would, in essence, uh, completely abrogate the power of judicial review. That the, that the Supreme Court stands as an anti-democratic institution, that it is a counter-majoritarian institution, that the purpose of the Supreme Court is to uphold the U.S. Constitution where there is majority political will at the moment through the elected branches to violate it. And that that is designed as a precious check on government power to protect our freedoms. Now, we the people can trump the Supreme Court anytime we want because we can amend the Constitution that they're sworn to uphold. So the people are still ultimately in charge, but it requires a supermajority of the people, two-thirds of Congress, two-thirds of the House, two-thirds of the Senate, and then three-fourths of the states to join together to change the Constitution instead of just a bare simple majority able to do it quickly and on a whim and just ram legislation through. So this goes to the heart of the court's role. Now, the, pub the American people rejected that 
they rose up. There was huge political opposition to FDR. But nonetheless, even as the plan was collapsing, there were two justices that had voted to strike down previous parts of the New Deal that were now getting weak knees on it because they didn't want the court undone. It was the issue, should we throw this fight, should we lose this battle to not lose the war of having the court re-engineered. It was totally unnecessary, but you know, they're, they're judges, they're not politicians, and they weren't quite sensing that FDR had lost this fight, that the danger had in fact abated. And so through the combination of those two changing, and a couple picks that, uh, that FDR did get, genuine appointments through, uh, through vacancies, suddenly you had the votes for a judge in Moffitt and Steele. Five years later, we realized the ultimate extent to which that could be taken. And that's the 1942 case of Wickard v. Filbert. And in Wickard, I can see that young lady is thumbs up. She was on that case. She was waiting for it. Uh, in Wickard v. Filbert, under the Agricultural Adjustment Act, farmers were told how many acres of what they could grow. Wickard farmer, uh, I'm sorry, farmer Wickard was a wheat farmer. And the AAA, uh, under the administration that was implementing the AAA, he was told that he had a permit to grow 11 acres of wheat. Instead, he grew 23. Now, the extra 12 acres, he didn't sell them. He instead kept them for, for personal use. His family, his farm, his, his animals, it was an issue that it would just be for personal consumption, not something that he would price and sell. Nonetheless, for growing more acres than the federal government told him he could, uh, he, was, he had a fine imposed on him, and he pursued that fine all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, where in the most consequential Commerce Clause case to, today, to that day, the, the Supreme Court said, no, this falls within interstate commerce. And in doing so, they transformed the substantial relationship test to the substantial effect test under an aggregation theory. And what that is, to put it together, is that, the, is that Congress can regulate activity that, even if done individually, would not have an impact. But actions that if done individually by a number of individuals would, in the aggregate overall, have a substantial effect on interstate commerce, then they can regulate that too. Now that's about a triple bang shot in terms of legal reasoning, but that's what the Supreme Court did. After Wickard, everyone thought the Commerce Clause was a dead letter, meaning something that's just worthless in law. I mean, it's, the words are in the Constitution, but you can't use it for anything. Uh, that was then reaffirmed in, uh, really reaffirmed in 1964, in the heart of Atlanta Motel, where the court upheld the authority to regulate uh, the admissions decisions of a, of, a, of a hotel or motel because people staying at the hotel Many of them had moved interstate, so they were involved in interstate commerce. Uh, also that same year, you had Katz, Katzenbach v. McClone, where there was a barbecue eatery that the court upheld the authority to regulate that eatery because some of the ingredients that they used in their food preparation, those ingredients didn't all come from in-state. Some of them had come from across state lines, so now this has a substantial effect. So coming off that, that that duo of cases in 1964, which again were a reaffirmation of Wickard from 42, everyone said, Commerce Clause isn't worthless. Everything is interstate commerce. Commerce is whatever Congress says it is, because if anyone challenges it, the Supreme Court will just side with Congress. Then we get to 1995. U.S. v. Lopez, a challenge to the Gun Free School Subset, whereby a 5 to 4 decision. Uh, the Supreme Court said, despite the fact that that act was passed pursuant to the Commerce Clause, supposedly, the court said no, simply possessing a firearm in proximity to a school building is not engaging in interstate commerce. And they struck down the law invalidating the conviction of a, of a high school student who had brought a gun to school. A high school student who challenged it because they wanted to go out and become a Marine, and he was told clearly, if you have this conviction on your record, you'll, you'll never get in the Marine Corps. So he decided to fight it, and, uh, and in the end, the Supreme Court sided with it. Then we have five years later, 2000, U.S. v. Morrison, another five-to-four decision, striking down the Violence Against Women Act. Now that gets emotional.